I'm actually very happy. I'm very excited to be doing a podcast in what is my morning. Yes. <laughs> I know you've had a lot of late night podcasts after midnight and such. So a little change up here. Exactly. Well, not just after midnight, but they're always in the evening these days for the last few weeks since Nick and I haven't been doing podcasts. So I've been, you know, I can't think as clearly at night and I'm not in as good a mood. You know, I'm very, I'm a morning person myself. So I'm very excited to speak to you in the morning. You're doing, are, you have a podcast with Big Lenny tonight? Uh, not tonight. Uh, oh. uh, last night, I think we did, or before last night. Okay. I saw yeah. some people commenting about, about him, so. Yeah, yeah, there's a podcast coming out. We're trying to do a mini intervention because his his shin has been bleeding incessantly in a very mysterious fashion, yeah. So we're trying to, but anyway, how are you, Pete? Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on because I only discovered you like a couple months ago. One of my clients, I'll give him credit, Reg Corsellis, he told me to check your stuff out. So I started binge watching all your stuff. I've watched a lot of the podcasts. I've watched every podcast with Boston. Those are my favorites. Um, I've watched a lot of the ones with Nick. I've watched some of the ones with Nick and uh, or watched some of the ones with Big Lenny and some of the ones with uh, Tony Huge. But it's honestly like I was going off anyway. I was coming off testosterone to get, try to regain fertility. But like your videos kind of motivated me to like take it to the next step and try to get my health dialed in. So it's been it's been huge. I can't thank you enough. Well, Pete, I've been hearing your name for at least five years or six years, but uh, unfortunately, I, I, it was my mistake. I never searched the name on YouTube. So I've actually been hearing about you from Jason Blaha. So Jason Blaha mentions you all the time. And so I, the name Pete Rubish is so familiar to me. So one day I had a video on and some guy called Pete Rubish commented on it. So I was confused. I was like, is this the same fellow? So I went to check you out and I was, of course, very honored and flattered that you commented. And I'm very happy that any of the informative videos that I used to make back in the day could in the least bit be helpful to you. I haven't been doing them as much lately because I'm trying to get the channel to grow a bit bigger before so i have more of a audience when i make those videos because they're less less interesting to most people but before we begin i want to ask you so before we begin about anything i want to tell you that i've watched some of your videos and i have to say you strike me as such a, a kindly and honorable and nice gentleman uh, i've already i feel like i know you and i'm very excited to know you better um, you made a comment on a video you made last week which had my name in the title uh, in which you were saying you know i had a lot of bodybuilders on my podcast and i've been talking about sort of the health effects of uh, the bodybuilding lifestyle, but I haven't had powerlifters on. And that's such a good point, Pete. And actually that wasn't my intention originally. It was just because I happened to know some bodybuilders or be able to get them on the podcast. But actually uh, I'm very much uh, in agreement with you in the sake that, for, for example, I started a podcast about arm wrestling a couple of weeks ago. We only had one episode. We tried to schedule another one, but something went weird. So we're going to continue that. So we're going to have one on arm wrestling. And um, we have, so the bodybuilding stuff, I'd like to get something on powerlifting as well. And I think there's a fourth sport also that I was looking at, but basically this is very interesting to me because of two reasons. One is that I, I used PEDs and I lifted weights before. So, and, and a lot of my interest in longevity comes because of that, because I was concerned about what I did to my health. But the second aspect is that these are some of the sports in which people use the drugs the most. So for me, as, from a biohacking perspective, it's very interesting to see what people do actively. So, you know, I've really actually been looking for more people I could speak to about powerlifting. So I'm so happy you joined us. Oh, yes, absolutely. I'm, I've seen, you know, I've been involved in it for about the last 10 years as far as the the anabolics portion of the sport. And I've, I've seen a lot of crazy things. I've done some crazy things myself. So I'm almost out of, I'm, I feel like there are parallels between you and I, as far as I'm 29 right now. And I started taking anabolics when I was 20 and I'm at a point in my life where I'm like, it's not worth the health, health risks to keep doing what I was doing. I'm trying to lose weight. I've lost uh, 20 pounds since November, 30 pounds since summer. And I'm just trying to be a lot healthier, get rid of my sleep apnea, things like that. Cause I see in powerlifting, people just don't care about their health. It's not out there. Like it's not, I feel like in bodybuilding, there's some knowledge about it, but in powerlifting, it's just reckless. It's everybody takes trend and everybody says they don't take trend, which is funny because it's been so stigmatized that everyone's like, I don't take trend now, but every guy at the top. Wait a blasts I'll, the I'll ask you more about this. Okay. So, so we're, I'm going to ask you certainly about that. We'll talk about more by the way, about your sleep apnea. I was wondering the same thing because I was looking at pictures of you and your neck looks like my neck used to look. So I'm assuming you yes. have a really bad sleep apnea or maybe you're lucky and you have a bit of a bigger vocal cord in there. 
Well, I got diagnosed with it 10 years ago and I just, I'm, I'm like, I wonder how much damage I did because I've like never used a CPAP. I just hate them. And so I'm like, all right, well, I was walking around normally at 250 to 260 and I'm like, I just want to shed a bunch of weight to try to get rid of it. So my wife tells me that I don't snore anymore, which is good. I'm down to like 232. I'm trying to get to 220 pounds, oh. compete at a lighter weight class. I'm hoping that will get rid of it completely. She said, I don't snore and I'm, I feel a lot better, but I'm just trying to kind of do what you did. Maybe not get quite as low, but just shed a bunch of weight. And also for the sake of my kidneys and my everything, my vitals. Well, let's talk about all of that in a bit. But before we do, I always like to try to get a perspective of the background of the person I have on the podcast. So I want to ask you the standard set of questions. I know you live in Tennessee. Are you from Tennessee? No. So I was lived in Wisconsin for 22 or 23 years. Most of my life grew up there. And then lived in Kentucky for one year. And then I came down here. I've been here for about five years. So. Okay. That's what I thought. I was Googling you and I saw Wisconsin and then I, one of your stories said Kentucky also. Did you grow up with two parents and uh, siblings? Yes. I have one sibling, two parents. All my grandparents uh, are deceased. I don't really have a major, a big extended family. Um, so I, I'm, we're kind of spread out. My parents are still in Wisconsin. My sister lives out in Colorado. Oh. And I just, it's, it's tough to keep in touch, especially with the COVID thing going on right now. But yeah. Uh, where is Rubish from the name? Do you know the ancestry? Sure. Well, I have, I've never, I want to do a 23 and me. I've never done one, but I'm told that I'm pro- predominantly Polish and German with a little bit of Czechoslovakian. Yeah. I wonder where the name Rubish comes from. Maybe it's Czech. Maybe some of the audience can comment down below. By the way, for the future, there's a website also for the audience to know the Mormons have the best resource for American ancestry. If you want to research the Mormon, the Church of Latter-day Saints has a website called familysearch.org. It's awesome. If you're an American with a few generations of ancestry in America, you'll probably be able to find your family and some of your ancestors on the website and you'll find trees. It's even better than ancestry. You don't need to do your genes to get it tested. So I bet you could find out pretty quickly. Yeah, um, I'll check that out. So who were you in high school? What kind of guy were you in high school? You know, I always ask that. Yeah, I mean, I was just a loner. Like, I didn't have any friends. I... um it, nobody picked on me because all I did was lift weights. So I was fairly big for high school standards. It was a pretty small school, probably about 300 kids. And I just kept to myself. Like I was the quiet kid. I just went about my business. I did well in school and then I'd go home and lift weights. And that's what I did every day. So I never went out on weekends. I always felt, um, I never felt like I was like anybody else. Cause I, I didn't go to parties and in Wisconsin, it's such a heavily heavy drinking culture. Mm-hmm that even in high school, everybody got drunk and went out on weekends and I just never did that. So I didn't really have any friends. So I felt like I was almost invisible, but it motivated me. I was never good with girls early on. It it was a big time motivation where I was like, I had a chip on my shoulder and I'm like, I'm going to make something of myself and show you all. And so that's what really pushed me up until I was 20 years old or so. Were you naturally introverted? What made you quiet? I was a hundred percent introverted and I never broke out of that until I started working as a doorman. Just so we'll we'll get uh, to, we'll get to, yeah. Yeah. I'll ask you more about that later, but yeah, I was curious. So you were just naturally introverted and quiet, but what inspired you to start lifting weights? Was it a desire to be stronger? Like in terms of social interactions? Yes. My dad was dabbling in weightlifting and he was uh, acquiring some equipment for our basement so I started out like anybody else with the bench and abs stuff. And then later I got into deadlift squats and I just fell in love with it. Like I liked it more than regular sports, um, even though I played sports. And I just felt like if I could become bigger and stronger, it would give me a leg up on everyone, basically. Yeah, me too, sort of. That's sort of uh, what inspired me also. And when I was, your, uh, I guess, in, in high school, so I was doing powerlifting also although I didn't continue with it. I had like a scarcity of resources. You know, I was in Dubai and nobody even knew what powerlifting was there. So there was no one in the gym that knew anything. And I was just reading Louis Simmons's hard to read articles, which are really hard to read. You (laughs) You have to get used to that style of writing. That's just one sentence, but it's one page long, you know, one run on sentence. So anyway, so that's pretty interesting. So did you, after high school, did you go to college? Or did you not? And we'll get into the to the jobs and stuff like that. But you didn't go to college, right? I did for two and a half years. So what happened was 
I, I got about 3.8 in high school. I, I just, you know, did the work basically. And I kept to myself. So I, I barely, I got in by the skin of my teeth to uh, the university of Wisconsin and they have very high standards. Yeah. So I got in there and basically the first day I was there, I was like, holy cats, I'm in way over my head here. Um, and from there it was kind of downhill. I, I was there for about two years. My GPA was hovering around two to 2.5. Um, <laughs> and it didn't help work until 3 AM every night. But, and then I basically did a semester at community college. And then I just was like, forget this. I'm going to start just, you know, doing coaching. So that was March of 2013. And I've been doing powerlifting coaching for the last eight years. So that's awesome. You know, the same thing happened to me. I got in like sort of by luck. I was one of the worst students in high school out of my whole class. And I got in the same school as the valedictorian sort of by accident, by luck. And the first two years, I was the same as you. I had like a two point something. I was like, well, I'm in way over my head. I'm not supposed yep. to be here. I can't compete with these people. But I had some other motivation. So I had to turn it around. So I worked really hard to turn it around. But the same thing happened to me. I, I was staying in classes with people that are in a completely different league than me. You know, <laughs> so exactly. Like, That's how it was. You know, University of Wisconsin, Madison is a well-known university. Also, same thing there. Yeah. yeah. So. So I wanted to ask you before we get into, I have some questions about powerlifting and then I want to ask you some of your stories also, but I have some questions about powerlifting. But before I do, I wanted to ask you, so what was compelling to you about powerlifting versus strongman and stuff? I guess maybe naturally you got into it, but why didn't you move on to bodybuilding, first of all, or strongman or Olympic lifting or arm wrestling or something else? Well, I tried bodybuilding a natural show when I was 19. And I was like 173 pounds on stage. And I just hated the dieting. I, I dieted my butt off for that show and crashed every one of my hormones because I didn't know what I was doing. I just starved myself into two hours of cardio a day. So mm -hmm. I tried that and I was like, and then after the show, I ate like enough food where I gained 15 pounds in two days. So I just hated that. I'm like, I, want, I don't want to have to eat like this. I want to eat what I want to eat. And then that was the main motivation where I'm like, I don't, bodybuilding's not for me. And I didn't have, I don't have the structure at all for bodybuilding. My waist is too big. My, my, I have no quad sweep. I have no bicep peak. Like I'm just not built at all for that sport. And then with strongman, it's just a matter of not having the access to the equipment or knowing anyone who trained it. Hmm. Whereas powerlifting is just barbell. Like you can do that anywhere. So True. ease of access with that. True. You know, when I was in uh, high school, the reason I started powerlifting was because originally I thought just weightlifting, you know, when you weightlift, you get bigger and that's how bodybuilders are. They're just weightlifters. But then I realized I heard this rumor that bodybuilders were not as strong as they looked. And there were these people who didn't look that strong, but were stronger than the bodybuilders. So once I heard that and I was like 12 years old, I was like, that's it. I can't do that. I can't look stronger than I am. I want to be a surprise. I want to be stronger than I look. You know what I mean? So that, I think I think that motivated a lot of people to go into strength stuff instead of bodybuilding. So we, we thought of ourselves as not the pretty boys, as the real deal, you know, like a, like a pickup truck that can get the job done. Whereas the bodybuilders like the Ferrari, it might break down, but it looks good. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I heard... I was listening to one of your podcasts. I don't remember which one. You said you were almost at a 700 pound deadlift. No, no, no. I was at a, no, in high school, I was near a 600 pound deadlift, like 580 or something like that. Okay. And then I, well, no, not 580. Sorry. It was uh, early 500s. And okay. then once I deadlifted without training. So when I went back into lifting in my later years, when I was arm wrestling, when I was my strongest, I didn't train legs for four years or so. But then one year, one, one night I went downstairs and just deadlifted and I did 580. So I think I could have probably gotten into a 700 if I was training the deadlift. Scott told yeah. me I would. Scott Mendelson was always trying to convince me to do, but I was like, uh, I already had a little bit of knee stuff and, and issues like that, which is, which I want to ask you about, but before I do, I want to ask you, what were your training methods? Did you use Westside Barbell? Did you use other methods? I've dabbled in everything, but basically back then, like even up to the age of 23, there was no plan. I just kind of like lifted as heavy as I could all the time. Oh, really? And uh, it wasn't structured at all. It was just like, oh, what can I get done and what can I accomplish? And day to day, like I would try to deadlift every other day, heavy stuff like that just killed my nervous system. Wow. There'd be so many times where my nervous system was destroyed and I would just try to keep pushing because I was like, I didn't understand how it worked as far as getting stronger. Really? So but you really... in the US, you had all the tools. In Dubai, I didn't have any tools and I was figuring it out and I'm older than you. But well, anyway, that's great. Reckless. You accomplished more. <laughs> well, it was just like reckless abandon. I'm like, well, I'm good at this and I enjoy it. And I just, 
it, it like made me feel happy to just push my limits. And I was like, I, I was, I would throw anything on the bar. I had no fear. <laughs> Whereas nowadays when I lift, I'm kind of like, Oh man, I hope nothing goes wrong. Like you have that voice in your head now where you're like, Holy cats, I could blow a kneecap out. But back then you're just like, whatever, let's just load the bar up and try it. What's the worst that could happen? Were you naturally strong in terms of your yes. nervous system? Is that what it was? I was naturally strong at deadlift and to a degree squat, not really bench because of my proportions. But I mean, I was pulling 740 on a stiff bar naturally. And naturally, I was squatting. my God. I, yes. In the 240s or 220s? That was like 220, 230. I got to 230 wow. natural. And then I also squatted 570 with no knee sleeves. So oh. uh, bench was right. like 325 ish, I want to say. You have long arms? But yes, that's why I'm good at deadlift, and bench has always been a struggle. Yeah, you should see Scott Mendelson's arms up close. They're really short. They're, they're, they're much shorter than you'd realize. But not all of those guys have that. short arms, apparently. Yeah. I, I feel like two things are involved, but I obviously I don't know what I'm talking about. One is the short arms, but I honestly feel like some people with shorter shoulders that sort of naturally go back. You know, people who are naturally have wide clavicles, I think do worse on bench presses because it's harder for them to pin the shoulder back. And I think it puts more pressure somehow on the shoulders, but I'm not, I'm not completely sure about that. But I always found it difficult for me to, to bench press, especially in high school. It was really, really difficult. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about the, the changes in powerlifting. So when, when I last was reading a lot about powerlifting, which was like in 2005 or so, the major technology in, in terms of training was the conjugate method. And there was sort of this uh, history of the Bulgarian or like, uh, you know, that nervous system training, grease the groove, Pavel kind of stuff there. But it was sort of the conjugate method. And I think there was a, there was another one that was well known for bench press training, but there wasn't much else. I wanted to ask since then in the last 15 years, has there been much progress in terms of training, uh, programming and technology like that? Yes, because honestly, like at this point in time, most people do not like conjugate at all. They say it doesn't work as well. They say Louis stuck in his ways and should evolve. And a lot, a lot of the West side guys get a lot of flack nowadays. And they're, they're not because back then the sport was all geared powerlifting. Now it's all raw. Like it's oh. looked at as people don't like all that gear. So nobody's really? doing that anymore. So the, the methodologies have changed tremendously and you'll see stuff like auto regulation now where you go in and you're like, okay, um, I'm going to hit a squat at RP nine, which means there's one rep in the tank and things like that. You see that a lot. People are better about training with higher frequency, higher volume, more specificity. Um, uh, so a lot of people don't think conjugate is enough volume to get you stronger. Interesting. So when you talk about more specificity, do you mean not using rota rotating max effort exercises? So you're actually doing the actual squat or box squat itself, not doing yeah. some you're basically just training the lifts we compete in over and over and drilling them to yeah, get more proficient at them. And because one thing that, oh, that like confuses me epistemologically about the conjugate method is this idea of rotating the max exercise for the squat, for example, between a, a box squat at a certain height and some other different box squat and some other different kind of hip uh, hinge exercise. The idea between changing them slightly every week what is the purpose of that actually? Is it to avoid um, injuries of wear and tear that are, I forgot what they're called, but like daily use injuries? Or is it to, what is it? What is the reason of changing it? Why don't you do the same box squat every max effort day? Well, the, I mean, part of the thought process is if you train the same movement over and over, you're working the same muscles, you're going to run them into the ground, injuries will crop up. But the predominant reasoning, I believe, is Louis believed in not having or fighting against adaptations. So he, he would say, well, if you keep doing the same thing, you're just going to adapt to it and you're never going to get anywhere. So he thought by rotating exercises, mm -hmm. he would always be stimulating his nervous system in a different way where he would never adapt. That was his thought process. The interesting thing is like you would have to rotate exercises in a frequent enough uh, cycle to where you don't lose that adaptations either. So you'd like adapt to one exercise, do another one, do another one, then go back to that one. So you maintain, I guess, multiple adaptations or something like that. It's a really uh, interesting concept. What do you think about the idea of, by the way, you just shocked me. I didn't actually know that um, geared uh, lifting is less uh, popular now. I, I didn't realize that. It's borderline obsolete. 
Really? Wow. Yes. Dogs. So even at West Side? Not I mean, at West they're Side. Still, they're still out there, but they're so ostracized now. No that, way. Oh, yeah. It's no unbelievable. Idea. Everybody's – the sport in the last five years has exploded. Exploded. Even when I started 10 years ago, like, competing – there were so many less people. I like I was it was so less competitive. Now it's like every week people are breaking world records. Um fascinating. Everybody's doing raw though. Yeah, I noticed that Nick Strength and Power was focusing on the raw bench with uh, the gentleman Maddox, but I didn't I thought that was just because he's a bodybuilder and it's more interesting as a bodybuilder to look at raw benches. But I didn't know that. That's really fascinating. So, this is my other question about training methods, and I don't want to talk too much about this because I know you want to talk about more interesting stuff, but the other thing I wanted to ask about is this idea of gene of uh, chains and bands because when I was powerlifting when I was 15 or 16, I didn't have chains or bands, but they, they were talking about using them. And I thought this, even just partials, like for the bench press partials that are not, that are at the end, the lockout. Well, I always got stuck at the bottom and most raw bench presses that I knew of were getting stuck toward the bottom. And so at the end was actually training. The end was helpful if you had something helping you off the bottom, like a shirt. So I always thought that this West side training for the bench press wasn't making me stronger because I was getting stronger at the, at the end, but not at the bottom, even with the JM press, for example, that's on the floor, you're still off. So I was thinking all of this stuff is sort of geared toward uh, geared uh, lifts. And then I would think the same would be true of chains and bands, but then I see even bodybuilders are using chains and bands. And I see the raw lifters are you like, for example, Jason Blah is using chains and bands now, but he's a raw lifter. So I was wondering, is there, is there, is it for acceleration once you've passed the sticking point? Cause you'd think the sticking point is what you want to train. Yes. In a way, like actually I love bands. Um, I use them with a lot of people because what they do is they teach you to accelerate faster and it, it's almost, I think it's uh, Newton's third law for every action. There's an equal and opposite reaction. So they cause you to descend quicker, which causes a quicker rebound. So they increase your acceleration. And then they also, they really work that lockout, whether it's on squat, deadlift, or bench, where a lot of people have issues. They just teach you to fire through faster. So if you have like a sticking point on any exercise, you almost want to train where you're, you're having to accelerate harder through the sticking point. It's, it's very oh, hard to explain. But fascinating. Like, I got you. That's really interesting. Well, thank you so much. I, I, I always wanted to ask these questions and I asked Scott these things, but Scott's not interested in discussing theory that much. <laughs> but by the way, for the audience that's been asking about Scott, so we will get Scott on the show soon. I tried not to get Scott until I got 10,000 subscribers. I didn't want him to come on as a favor. So now he'll start coming on. But Scott's got quite a personality. He's like Lee Priest or Greg Valentino. He's a strong personality, not so much of a calm uh, thing to discuss. So hopefully I'll learn from you and we can have Scott on for entertainment as well. Um, so I want to ask you a final thing for audience to know what were your peak lifts before uh, you went uh, got off the stuff in competition 871 on deadlift 395 kilos uh, squat was 772 and just knee sleeves 350 kilos and then bench was 463 210 kilos oh you got but your done, bench up there too wow. yeah i've done more a little more in the gym on bench and uh, deadlift i did 920 in the gym on deadlift seriously then, that's incredible it was with straps. I mean, I wasn't holding it myself, really. But well, they're all using straps these days, so I noticed that too. Yeah. <laughs> and then the bench was 485 in the gym, so it was it was decent. But I was all of those lifts were on a a fair amount of trend. So. Okay, so yeah, we should talk about the trend. Wait, briefly, I want to ask you, what is this story of a UFC fighter mistaking you for oh a Uber gosh. driver? What is this story that your email got me excited? I've been waiting to ask you about this for a week. Nobody even knows this story. This was a funny one. I was, it was my first or second year at the Arnold classic. I don't know if you've ever been to that, but I have, yeah, it's crazy. So there's the main host hotel, which is connected to the convention center. It's the Hyatt and all the bodybuilders stay there. All the athletes, everybody stays there. Well, I stayed outside on the outskirts is Columbus or whatever. And I was driving in that night to pick up a shirt from somebody at the host hotel, one of the fellow power lifters. So I was in the circle, like it's a valet. You can't, there's no parking lot. It's just valet. And I have this beater old station wagon from 2002 for focus station wagon. List like, looks like a crappy car. This was before the days of Uber and stuff like that. So it was just cabs. And I'm just like waiting there for like 20 minutes. And all of a sudden I said, it's, it's night out, by the way, I see this guy approaching my car and he's like really tall. And I, I'm like, I'm pretty sure I know who that is. I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's Todd Duffy who, 
fought in the UFC, was a, was a heavyweight, 6'5", 250, and he was one of the better fighters at the time. He's walking up to my car, and I'm like, I kind of give him like a nod because I'm like, <laughs> he's looking right at me. So I'm like, all right, man. He just walks to the back of my car and gets in the back seat. <laughs> like, he just, just gets in my car, and I'm just, I look back like this. <laughs> It's nice to meet you, Todd. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm like, are you Todd Duffy? He's like, yeah, man, what's up? And I was like, uh, I'm sorry, dude, but I'm not a cab driver. And he was like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, dude. And he just gets out and goes on his way. <laughs> <laughs> you'd think you'd chat with him a bit longer also. He's a very famous kinda, guy, actually. <laughs> I was like taken aback. I'm like, what the actual heck is going on right now? There are always stories from the Arnold, aren't there? The Arnold is really oh fun to gosh. go to. Yeah, we should tell the audience that everyone should go to the Arnold once when they can. Not it's the Olympia, the Arnold. The Arnold's so a circus. It is a circus, especially if you're single, by the way. We, we aren't single anymore, but for the single people to go there, it's very fun. Yeah, I'll probably never go back. I went five years. It was it was. Oh, it was nice for a while, like doing the cage and everything, the animal cage, like huge crowds around you. But I, well, I'm never going to go back at this point. I'm pretty much I'm, I'm coming to starting to settle down a little. And it just doesn't interest me. I don't like going up there when it's freezing cold. Yeah, Columbus. it's way too cold for God's sake. It's, it always snows there every year. Yeah, it's ridiculous. If you're not on a lot of steroids, it's way too cold. But if you are, people are walking around doing fine, actually. <laughs> I've seen so many famous dudes though at the Arnold like Martin Ford was the biggest guy I've ever seen in person and who I've is, seen Dallas McCarver and Martin Ford I literally was looking up at him like this who is Martin like, Ford I don't know who he is he's just some like he's not even he doesn't compete he's like this look him up he's super famous he's from uh some European country he's like seven feet tall 350 pounds Whoa. he made Rich Piano look tiny Whoa. like I saw Rich Piano I saw him in the same expo and I was like this guy is bigger than bodybuilders <laughs> he's like an actor, um, but he is hopped up on a ton of sauce. You can tell I saw him. I saw, I saw Lane Norton. That was an interesting experience, but I probably can't get into that right now. You might, you, off get camera. Yeah, you might get sued. That's true. Uh, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't mean I don't in a bad way. We, we like Lane, but I, yeah, it's dangerous. Yeah, no, no, so, but, um, I was going to ask you about the, 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 so let's talk about drugs in powerlifting briefly. So you made this video uh, last week <laughs> saying that, you know, in, in powerlifting, people don't care about their health, which I would love Pete, if you could tell me and the audience more about that, because I've only known one really top uh, powerlifter. I mean, I've known others, but I don't know I'm not close friends with them. So I don't know how their lives go. So what do you mean in terms of, they don't, I mean, the, how bodybuilders think about it is powerless, powerlifters don't eat all day. They eat when they want to eat, they eat whatever they want to eat. Mm -hmm. And bodybuilders don't really know what kind of drugs they use. Bodybuilders have heard that strong men abuse drugs because uh, ma mainly Jason Blah actually has been popularizing that, which is true. Um, but they don't know much about powerlifters. So maybe you can tell us more about health and powerlifting. Yeah, powerlifting, um, then I was this way for so long, like you don't care at all about your diet. You just eat junk food. Um, and then everybody at a certain level, once they get on stuff, everybody jumps right to trend. And basically, honestly, anybody, just about anybody can hit a 2000 pound total if they take enough trend. Um, I, my peak trend doses were like 700 milligrams a week. Trend ace. This was, uh, this would be two weeks before a meet. So normally I would do 350 a week, 75 milligrams every other day. That was my typical, but before I meet, I'd bump it up 700 and just hit it hard. And everybody takes trend pretty much all the top lifters. They are. And the thing is trend is so stigmatized. Like I was saying that everybody denies that now. So the new thing is rather than people saying they're natural, they just downplay their doses like crazy. I never yeah. believe anybody. Well, everybody I noticed that in loves. bodybuilding, but is that a true in powerlifting too? A hundred percent. Nobody's going to tell you what they're actually doing. Cause it's, it's like, it, it's like you said, it props you up. If, if, if you're taking you, you much, you're genetically. Yeah, yeah, of course. But everybody in powerlifting, the, the biggest problem, and I've watched all the kidney podcasts and such, everybody's got elevated blood pressure, significant. Uh, yeah. It's not uncommon for people to be 180, 100, 200, 110. This is normal. They're walking around like this for years. And I was probably about 160, well, 100 for a while. And I'm sure, I don't know what it got to on trend, but. I was always too scared to get blood work on these heavy cycles. I just like buried my feet in the sand. I didn't want to see it. I, I didn't want to know. So there's never, no one ever talks about health. No one ever takes health supplements. It's not a thing. 
there's, it's just not, it's all about get as strong as possible and you downplay the risks. And I was that way. And that's why I'm, I'm a kind of like, nobody was talking about it. I, I got into, I got into anabolics because I saw another guy, Chris Hickson, the same age as me. And he was blowing past me. And I'm like, what the heck, man? Why is he blowing past me? He, I'm going to do what he's doing. Mm. So I basically just had an ego, like, was like, I'm going to start taking stuff too at age 20 because I want to mm. compete with him. And I just, it was so reckless. Like I had crappy gear that gave me big knots where I could barely walk around for a week. Um, I get, I got horrendous cystic acne. I still have yeah. scars from, from it. The it's trend? gotten better, but that's never going away. Like these scars, because the gear was so crap, crappy. Um It'll just, go away. It'll go away with with a few years. You'll be surprised. It's faded a lot, but it's still it's still not completely gone. And I'm just like, I was pinning the worst stuff, and just I don't know. You just back then you put whatever you wanted into your body. You didn't care. I mean, you thought you're invincible. You're like, whatever. I'll just if somebody hands you something, you take it. And a lot of guys are are doing that now. It's the same way. So. So what, you know, one interesting, so in arm wrestling, trend isn't that popular because in arm wrestling, endurance is a huge issue. So if you can't, if you don't blow through someone and you get stuck and you're on trend, you're screwed. You're not going to be able to breathe properly. Now I'm going to be on Derek's uh, show, I think uh, from more plates, more dates, probably later this week. And we're going to talk briefly about Dennis Siplenkov, who I think you've heard of before. Have you heard of Dennis Siplenkov? He's the sure. Ukrainian guy with the fingers that are this wide. Remember that no, guy? The guy that clo- breaks walnuts with his fingers and he's, he used to be a strong man. Oh, if you've never seen him, I'll send you pictures of him. He's crazy. But most of the audience knows who he is. So he apparently, according to inside sources, which I, he apparently was on trend for years, which is really surprising as an arm wrestler because, but he was so strong that he never got stopped. So he just never would get stuff. He's the strongest arm wrestler who's ever lived, completely invincible. And basically, so he went into kidney failure a year ago. And so he had to lose all his uh, muscle. He hasn't publicized it, what the issue was, but it was kidney failure probably from taking that highly androgenic trend for so long. By the way, I loved your video when you mentioned the less androgenic steroids that you would use. I totally agree with your choices. Those are far less androgenic. Did you know that uh, Oxandrolone and Anavar, despite being an oral, has never been found to cause liver cancer? There's, I haven't found one report. I didn't know that, but honestly, anytime I've ran Anavar, my uh, liver enzymes don't budge. Yeah, because it's but not it's not very androgenic. That's the it reason. It does cut HDL in half. Every time I've ran it, my HDL literally gets cut 50%. That's the only thing that I see on the labs, though. So your HDL uh, rising, I mean, we could talk about this briefly. So generally, cardiologists or lipidologists think that HDL shooting down is a bad sign. Yes. uh, Because it's involved in reverse cholesterol transport. But personally, I'm not as afraid of that as I am of LDL rising, because the LDL rising is the pool with which your body can pull out uh, stuff to put in plaque for your arteries. So if you have less LDL, even if you have a lot of inflammation in your body, you don't have as many particles that could get lodged in your arterial wall, even if they're not reverse cholesterol transported back well. Um, also, just so you know, sometimes like raising your HDL, like you mentioned in that video that my HDL was very high that time I did my blood test, raising your HDL may be cosmetic. So for example, if you take high dose niacin, all day, your HDL will triple or double, but it will have no impact on cardiovascular mortality. So my HDL may have been particularly high because of citrus bergamot, which may have no impact on actual mortality, but my LDL was low because of actual, I mean, that was a real thing. You know what I mean? There can be artificial elevations, but usually not artificial declines. So usually it's, it's useful to take the decline, but generally I don't focus so much on HDL personally. I ask you a question about this. Um, I took citrus bergamot once and my cholesterol, like my LDL didn't budge. And your LDL may not budge, but your HDL would get higher. Oh, right? Okay. I, and my LDL, I freaking quest hasn't sent me the results back. So I'm curious to see where my, my labs are at. I'll send them to you when I get them. But sure. my LDL, I don't think I've ever seen it below 120 on a blood test. So should, so should I go on something like a Zetamib or yeah, would that be a good choice a- for me? 
Let's talk about that. That's a great question. So you mentioned also, yeah, how is my LDL so low? So I have a polymorphism in the LDL receptor that makes my LDL receptor more functional than the average LDL receptor. So it's a little bit easier on me to have lower LDL cholesterol. Not that much easier. I don't have a crazy polymorphism like uh, the CTAP or the APOC3 or the um, or the PCSK9 in, uh, genes. I don't have those polymorphisms, but I have the LDL receptor hyperactive one. Um, you may have none of those protective genes. So 120 isn't that high. If you were sitting around normally not on gear with a total cholesterol, say, say with your LDL cholesterol of 150 or above, we would say you probably have some polymorphisms that make you particularly predisposed to getting high cholesterol. Either way, it doesn't really matter. The point is you have to make sure that that LDL cholesterol is at or below 70 because above the level of 70, we've seen in the literature evidence of women developing plaque above the, uh, the level of 70. And we would assume people like you and I may have higher inflammation than those women. Uh, inflammatory cytokines help in the de deposition of plaque. So we really don't want to be above 70. So you want to get yourself at 70 using, using medications that are known to extend life among people with cardiovascular disease. You don't want to use something like, uh, like niacin or citrus bergamot originally. First, get it in range, then add your citrus bergamot, whatever else that you're not sure will work. So what I would do personally, if you're at 120, ezetimibe will probably not be enough for you on its own. It may be if you totally remove saturated fat and dietary cholesterol and add ezetimibe at 10 milligrams a day, which ezetimibe, obviously it has less side effects than the other ones. You probably will need some kind of statin. You may want to combine a weak statin like pitavastatin with ezetimibe. That might be enough for you. So you get le less side effects from the statin, which are brain fog, um, muscle weakness, and diabetes, 10% in men diabetes, 25% in women or 30% get diabetes. The, by the way, the better option to a statin is a PCSK9 inhibitor, but you don't qualify for it because your cholesterol isn't high enough. You'd have to pay out of pocket 5,000 a year. If you took that, you wouldn't have the muscle weakness risk or the diabetes risk. So without that, you, you could have a zetamibe with a weak statin like pitavastatin, or you could take a very light statin like rosuvastatin, which is the one I take sometimes, some very rarely. Um, which doesn't enter the brain. So hopefully it won't cause much brain fog, but it could still cause a little bit of diabetes or some muscle atrophy. But there's also a fourth medication I always mention, which is called, which is a new one called bempedoic acid, which is yes. similar to statins. It inhibits cholesterol synthesis, but, uh, but it's more specific to the liver. So it might have less side effects. You could use some, one of those medications to get your, one or two of those medications to get your level to around 70, then add in your EPA at four grams a day, like in the reduce it trial, or sorry, in the reduce it trial for the uh, pharmacologic medication called Vasepa, which is pharmacologic EPA. Four okay. grams a day reduces heart attacks by, or not heart attacks, but cardiovascular mortality by 25% among people already on statins. So it's really okay. powerful. So, you know, that should probably uh, deal with a lot of your uh, risk from atherosclerosis. But you'd also want to go to go to a doctor, your cardiologist, and you maybe if you have heart disease in your family, you tell him my mother died of heart disease in her 40s and her family also did so that you have a family uh, reason for the doctor to check. Because you don't want to tell me, hey, I've been on steroids for 10 years, please check everything. He's not going to. So you tell him instead, hey, in my family, I have a predisposition for heart disease. You don't need to lie. You can exaggerate a little bit and not be too specific. And so he takes it seriously and tell him, look, I've had high blood pressure for 10 years and I've never taken medications for it. I want a medication or whatever if you don't have one. And then tell him, I want to do a cardiac fMRI because everyone died. Why do you want a cardiac fMRI? Because the CAC score just shows you the calcium buildup, which is 10 years later, right? The, the, the stress test tells you how well your heart is functioning. Nothing tells you how much plaque you have except the cardiac fMRI, which takes four hours or so to do. And the machine costs a million dollars. So it costs so much that you got to put it on insurance. And so you got to have that family history or something to get on insurance. And once you do that, you'll know how well is my heart functioning? Exactly how much growth do I have in the left ventricle? Um, is there any buildup of plaque that I have to be worried about? This is what could have saved Dallas. Yeah, and it was shortly after Dallas passed away because I used to see him all the time at the gym, and it freaked yeah, me out. Because yeah, we're we're the same age. Like our birthdays are like a couple weeks apart. So when I saw that, I was like freaked out because I'm like, I didn't think that was possible for someone to have like a 95 percent blockage at age 26. Um, 
so I didn't know, I didn't know at the time, but I got, I got the plaque score done. I was at like a two. I didn't know that. Yeah, uh, calcium plaque. Score. Yeah, the ca- yeah. So the calcium artery, uh, coronary artery, artery calcium score, the CAC score. You got a two number. Yes. Okay, so so that means you have very little plaque ten years ago that healed, which is a good sign, and it's very little, which means you need to go check out how much plaque developed in the last ten years. By the fMRI. Yeah, by the fMRI. Usually, you should have a zero CAC score before the age yeah. of forty or so. So that means that you had something. Now, the good news is it's not, I know maybe you, you might feel like a little downtrodden and feel like you're working uphill to heal yourself, but I want you to know something. There are studies that show that people who had atherosclerosis that changed their lifestyle completely, 10 years later, the plaque has re- gotten, disappeared. So it can reverse itself. It's not like you're stuck with the plaque for life as long as you change your lifestyle. Does, uh, doesn't K2, MK7 play a role in that? K2 and MK7 play a particular role in the uh, in calcium, where calcium is deposited. The concern is that you might start calcifying parts of your body that don't need to be calcified. The concern is that, look, when you have plaque lodged in your arterial wall, it has to be calcified to heal it. But your body may also be overactive in trying to heal things. So there may be something that doesn't need to be healed and your body calcifies it. So to avoid this excess calcification that, for example, leads to people having elbows that are pointy or bunions or things like that, or a lot of calcium in their arteries, you have to, of course, have enough uh, vitamin K. But that's not to do with the plaque. The, pla- the calcium is, the, is, the, is, is just, it's just the solution at the end to close the plaque. The plaque okay. is the thing that builds up and that's the thing that blocks the artery, Right. So you want to actually check how much plaque do you have just so you know, so you can be aware. And so you can know if you need, for example, a bypass at some point. And so you can know, you know, how seriously do you have to take lowering your LDL cholesterol and so on. But yeah, tell me, I think, oh, go, no, ahead. go ahead. No, no, you're good. I'm just at the point where the biggest thing I'm like, I still would like to do a couple competitions in the next five years. But like I said, it, it'll be a much milder cycle. Like I want to do like a 15 week cycle of Primo, Anavar, test at some point um, down the line. But I want to stay off. I want to stay off testosterone this whole year and everything, and eventually do a little HRT. And I, I know we'll keep the androgens low. Plus, mm. I wasn't feeling anything at the end. Like I've been on stuff so long, I didn't matter what I took. I didn't notice it. Like I barely felt anything. Yeah, so I was so desensitized. But I'm trying to be as healthy as possible now and like reverse some of the damage I did. We'll definitely talk more about that and also off offline if you'd like, if you have any questions. And I would, I wanted to, I'll mention this to you later, but there's a drug called Mifepristone, which is M-I-F-E-P-R-I-S-T-O-N-E for the audience. Mifepristone is an antagonist of most of the steroid receptors in the body, including the progesterone receptors and the androgen receptors. Taking 100 to 300 milligrams of that, which is usually used by the way for pregnant women, it's an off topic thing, but if you use that to block all the receptors for a few days, you'll upregulate those receptors. So for example, when Dave Palumbo tells people to uh, take two weeks or not two weeks because you're on long esters, but take a while totally off gear, the reason is to upregulate those androgen receptors so you respond. You could you could do a PED break also. You could you could take a break and add mefepristone so that you're even less you feel even less androgens and your androgen receptors upregulate just to get more out of your gear. But you can also do this when recovering, which we could talk about in a second. But could you tell me more about Dallas? So you were working out with him in Kentucky. I didn't work out with him per se, but we were at the same gym when we were in Kentucky, and we were at the same gym when we were in Tennessee. So. When he was in Kentucky, he was younger, my age, you know, he was up and calmer, up and calmer. And so he wasn't as well known or anything. He wasn't as big, but he would train with Matt Jansen there. And I knew Matt Jansen quite well. I, I used to go to his house and everything. And uh, so I was friends with him and I saw them training around, didn't think much of it. And then he started once we literally me, Matt and Dallas all moved to Tennessee, like at the exact same time in the same area. It was weird. It, it would didn't. It just was a coincidence, but we all moved to Tennessee and the Knoxville area at the same time. So we were training at the same gym. And when we trained, it was during the day. There was literally no one there. It was just like me, Dallas, Matt, and maybe like two other people. And so I saw him quite a bit. I was on quite a bit of trend then. So I wasn't very sociable. <laughs> I didn't, I wish I would have talked to him more. Like we, we talked a little, but it was almost like, you know, my ego was like, this guy's huge and awesome and I can't handle it almost in a way, even though it's a different sport. Yeah. So, and then the other thing, 
he started blowing up in strength. I'm like, crap, man, he looks amazing. And now he's coming from my strength. <laughs> so there was a little jealousy of like, he was nipping at my heels as far as my deadlift. And I was like, what the heck? Bodybuilders aren't supposed to be able to do this. Because <laughs> people don't even realize he was the strongest bodybuilder back then. So he pulled 865 one time. Wow. He pulled 865 in the same room that I trained in. And uh, I was had just pulled like 880 or something like that. So then come to find out, he had tried a 900-pound deadlift one day. And I didn't know about this. He got it to his knees. So he didn't quite get it, but he got it to his knees, 900 pounds. I didn't know at all. This was like three to five days later. I try 900 and just smoke it. And I, I was like, I felt bad later because I discovered after that he had just missed it. So it looked like I was like trying to show him up. And I'm like, I didn't know. I had zero <laughs> clue. But I, we didn't have a ton of interactions. And Matt was so focused with him. Like they were he would puke his guts out after his training sessions. And I mean, they were just like, they brought, they go one thing to the other, like zero rest, just super set. Everything, everything was heavy. It was, it was impressive to see. He would throw up the 200 pound dumbbells for like eight reps on incline, like nothing. Wow. wow. Did just you like nothing. Did you notice that he had that blue color that you see on powerlifters sometimes on the day of a competition that, you know what I'm talking about? Like when, I, do you know I the know color? First of all, not about Dallas, but do you know the color? Do you know what I'm talking about? When people go into a competition and yes. they have no color and you know, they've just taken a bunch of anadrols and there's like, or, or it's, or it's like a bluish color. Have you like ever seen purple, that? Bluish? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 That's, isn't that the blood pressure too is like through the roof. It is the blood pressure, but I think it's, it's causing blood not to get to the surface. So you're not seeing the color as much. They look like they're suffocating. Actually. It's sort of a bluish color. Um, actually there's, it's a funny thing, a funny story. This is off topic, but I was reading recently. There's a, there's a family in Kansas that in the, the hillbillies in Kansas and the Appalachian mountains that actually are all blue. They're literally blue. I should, I should, I should do it. I'm going to do a series oh. called Leo surfs Wikipedia where I'll, I'll discuss <laughs> these kind of things. But anyway, so yeah, people would come blue, like some, some arm wrestlers or powerlifters I knew they would come to the competition, not speak for two hours before they'd be sitting, looking really angry. Their face is blue. They don't talk to anyone. Then they come and they have this crazy energy and you know, they just popped a ton of anadrols. When I would look at Dallas, I would see sometimes that skin color that they would have on the day of the competition. You didn't notice that in person though, huh? No, I, the only thing I noticed really, I'm like, well, this guy's massive. And then number two, I was like, his facial structure and jaw were very predominant from the yeah. GH, yeah. which I'd never seen. Like, it's like I saw it on Rich Piano when I saw him, but like, it was his, it was like his head had grown or something. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, God rest his soul. He was a very good man, I hear, and uh, good to his he, fans. And he was. I, 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 like I said, I didn't have a ton of conversations with him, but I was really sad when I heard that I was shocked. I was driving home from Wisconsin and uh, my wife told me, and I was like, what the hell? I was, I was just like shocked. I'm like, I used to see this guy every day and I didn't think that, would, that, that was possible. I didn't think someone could die at 26, uh, even despite doing what we're doing. And it really scared me. It like freaked me out. And that was pretty much when I gave up trend. I was just like, uh, that that changed my life as far as how much risk I was willing to take because it was yeah. a real wake up call. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's really true. I mean, I think it was for everyone, for everyone. But, but I would I would say that I really think that Dallas probably had an APOE four variant and some really bad uh, variants genetically to cause that level of plaque development, which is just insane to get that level of plaque by 26. I mean, it's not common, but still he could have, if he just had one cardiac FMRI, they would have known, oh shit, he's, he's got to have a bypass right now. You know what I mean? Yeah, and he had a lot of organ enlargement and like kidney. Enlargement. I, what's that? kidney specifically and the kidney and that's that's really interesting right because that's what we talk about with androgenic signaling androgenic signaling causes the glomeruli to to it causes the kidney to hypertrophy so when the kidney hypertrophies the glomeruli break and that's focal uh with the fsgs glomerulosclerosis which is what bo had on the last episode that's yeah. that's what that is is the androgenic signaling making the kidney split up and grow and that's what dallas had is heavy kidneys big kidneys do you think if he would have just had like blood work done, would he have seen a lot of issues? Or no, like I mean, so the, so the blood work, you'll just see your creatinine go down. You won't actually know the scarring on the kidney unless you do an ultrasound, which by the way, is really cheap. 
it's actually really cheap to do an ultrasound and you could easily do one every year. Easily, no, no question. And you can usually see if there's some kind of scarring. The thing is, it's really such a shame that bodybuilders don't. So look at this, Pete. The thing is the EGFR is an estimated glomerular filtration rate. It's not the real glomerular filtration rate. It's just an estimation based on using one metric called creatinine. You're trying to figure out how much fluid are the kidneys actually passing through every day. Now, creatinine doesn't work for bodybuilders. Everybody knows that. I was just looking at a paper from The Lancet 2017, where it's just called chronic kidney disease. The audience can go read it. The Lancet 2017, chronic kidney disease. And you can see when they described the estimated glomerular filtration rate, this paper is meant to be just a state-of-the-art paper, like for all the doctors to know what's going on with CKD right now. And they see clearly, like if the person is muscular, creatinine will not work. You need to use C-estatin C and use a C-estatin C based estimated glomerular filtration rate and compare the two. So even that the bodybuilders don't know about. So they're not even getting the best blood work they could get. They're not getting the C-statin C. They're not getting the alpha fetoprotein, which would tell them if they have a liver cancer, 70% likelihood of telling them. They don't, they don't know about that. So the blood test won't tell you that much, except your LDL cholesterol is high, your creatinine is high, your AL, ALT and ASD are high. And they won't tell you whether you have a liver cancer or whether you have damage to your kidneys or it's a short-term thing because you have a lot of muscle they won't tell you whether you have plaque development or if it's just LDL high. What about if my TSH has never been that low? Like the lowest I've gotten, my TSH is 2.8. It's been up to, yeah, it's been up to 4.7 before. And I'm like, what an actual heck. And I do have family history of thyroid problems. Is that just hypothyroidism so, or? I think that actually, honestly, I have to do like a series on thyroid one day because I know very little about the thyroid. So I have absolutely no comments I can give you, but I've begun to notice just because Palumbo got thyroid cancer, uh, unfortunately, and we hope he survives. And of course he survived, but we hope yeah. it goes very well. Um, but because of that, I've been reading a little bit about thyroid cancer. I was surprised to find that. Did you know that thyroid cancer well, no, it's not, no, that wasn't about thyroid cancer, but thyroid cancer is one of the biggest growing cancers in the US. It's like, it's like a, almost an epidemic. And the cause of it is not completely clear. Like for example, radiation adds to thyroid cancer, but for example, kidney problems also cause thyroid cancer. So when you have high uremia in your blood, due to either having, uh, due to having kidney problems, you're more likely to get thyroid cancer and kidney cancer. Those are the two cancers in particular you're likely to get. So I wanna study more about the thyroid and figure out what does it have to do with bodybuilders where a lot of their thyroids are not functioning well or weightlifters in general, like Dallas, for example, had thyroid cancer also. Yes. You know, it's yeah, weird. A lot of people have very that. low thyroid function. Yeah, I, I just, I don't know. That's always been, I assume part of it is family history, but I'm, I'm I think it may be more than one. That. I got a question for you with blood work. What if my absolute eosinophils are always elevated for your immune system? Yes, they're like every blood test I've ever had done. My absolute EOS is elevated, not by a crazy amount, but it's always elevated. Also, also not my expertise. I'm not very aware of the immune system in general, but I'm not very aware of um, biomarkers for the immune system. I only really study the immune system in terms of inflammatory cytokines uh, because of my Crohn's disease and stuff like that. But I don't know that much about them. I could look at them for you also. I could, we could look at them together, but I don't, I don't know much about the thyroid. I don't know much about the immune system. I really just study, you know, obviously I'm not a doctor. I just study stuff myself as I, as I need to learn about them, you know? Yeah, it's it's just it's funny because ever since I but started going down. What is your C-reactive protein? I have no freaking clue. I need to get that done because ah. I haven't done that one. Because because I don't know I don't know what that biomarker exactly tells us, but you may have a hyperinflammatory system, and that's very common among people that have used androgens for long periods of time, because it, because of various reasons. I mean, the androgens themselves are you, they, basically the lifestyle leads to immune dysfunction because your immune system is trying to deal with all these androgens with different kinds of stress, oxidative stress, not just androgens, oxidative stress on cells. So eventually dysfunction tends to happen with the immune system. People tend to get arthritis, like, like a lot of weightlifters who have had shoulder replacements and stuff. It's not just because of the tension there. They actually had arthritis because of inflammatory cytokines attacking the joints or people get colitis like John Meadows or Crohn's like me, or a lot of people get these kind of immune system dysfunction stuff. So maybe we could uh, talk about 
about it more and and you could get a test of your inflammatory cytokines from yeah. Quest Diagnostics, which does that test. Oh, I'll do And it. you could check your C-reactive protein and your fibrinogen to see if you have systemic inflammation and you could do local inflammation tests also. I'm getting labs done this whole year, every month. So if you just tell me what labs to get, I'll do it. But Oh, sure. Because this is, this is kind of an experiment because I don't think anyone's ever really chronicled this or done this where they've been on steroids for a prolonged period of time. They come off and literally document every month along the way, like, how am I feeling and what's what are my levels at and how's, how are things rebounding? Exactly. But I've also noticed, like, as I focus on health, I'm becoming more of a hypochondriac where I'm like every thinking every little thing is cancer and stuff. I don't know if you get that. Like, yeah, yeah, I, it starts to give me anxiety where I'm like. I, I had really bad anxiety about a month or two ago and it's, it's kind of gone away, but I was like getting crazy anxiety and I'm always like paranoid. I'm like, Oh, what if I got cancer? And don't worry. I don't so I, I've been there before. So a, a couple of things I want to note. One thing for the audience to know, people have not went off steroids and went completely off everything before for extended periods of time that we know about in the public sphere. There's nobody who's went off for more than two years and not been on HCG and been talking on camera or anything like that. I think I'm the only person that has ever been off fully, fully, fully off everything. You know, even getting my wife pregnant, I didn't use anything. So I haven't been on anything. I'm planning to potentially experiment with HCG now, Amino Asylum. Leo 20 is the code, Amino Asylum. I don't get money from them. I don't get money. I like them. They're good Wait, guys. They sell HCG? They have HCG, yeah. They're oh. good guys too. They're good guys, yeah. So Nick, there's Nick said he could help me out, but... Nick Trigilli? Yeah. Yeah, he probably could also, absolutely could. Yeah, he has HRT clay. They probably have, uh, you know, pharma grade stuff also. So, uh, but yeah, so I might experiment with it now, but I haven't before. Not many people have actually went off fully. So people would yeah. go off and then be on HCG. Yeah, of course, everything's working. With, I mean, <laughs> not of course, but everything's working with HCG. They tell you, yeah, I'm fine. And then, yeah. and then you know, then they go back on TRT a year later. So you, you never actually see, is it possible to actually recover? So that's why I was always trying to say it in my videos. I was like, guys, nobody has ever actually even said that. So that's one of the reasons I focus on using HCG on cycle, which we'll get to in a second. Before we get to that stuff, I want to ask you, uh, we have so many things to talk about, really. Well, you have to come on again. You have to come on again. But we should do this every month or something. I don't know. (laughs) Absolutely. I agree. So um, actually, what I think, I think you should have a series with you. That should be a, I have the uh, biohacking and bodybuilding. I think we should have a biohacking and powerlifting one. And we can chronicle chronicle your recovery and, you know, discuss powerlifting current events and stuff like that. I thought that would be really cool. But so I have a few more questions I wanted to ask you, but let's talk about fertility first a bit, just to make sure we we get through that a little bit. And then maybe we'll have a chance before my next podcast has a couple more. So tell me about your fertility goals. So I wanted to know something. Are you trying to recover? Are you trying to gain fertility to conceive? Or are you trying to gain fertility to go off permanently? Or are you trying to, and if you're trying to go off permanently, are you trying to just be able to go off and then go back on for short periods and then stay off? Or you want to be on TRT long term? What is the goal? Okay. So, right. So, the original goal, that's why I came off November 15th, was to regain fertility. Before I say that, so, so sorry to interrupt you. One thing hypochondria. Listen, people who are hyperchondriacs, they die. That's what happens when you're too cool about your health oh. and you're not worried, you die. So it's cool. It's okay to be a bit of a hypochondriac. You'll probably be alive when others would not be, but obviously, you know, anxiety is a separate issue and we can talk about that privately later. And there's so many ways you can deal with your anxiety and stuff like that. But I would applaud you for being a hypochondriac. Hypochondria leads to death. Anyways. Makes uh, sense. Yeah. So, so tell me, what were your goals? Uh, so originally I came off November 15th. It was to regain fertility to conceive. Um, and I know you said like 90 days isn't enough to change your epigenetics and stuff. I I'm kind of, I'm not well versed as much as I need to be. I watched all your videos and that's when I realized I was like, Holy cats, uh, these basic two month PCT protocols, they tell you are not at all sufficient. So I went in like obviously 60 days after my last shot of testosterone, I was at 38, to stop total testosterone ng per dl um i did about a 16 day period alternating hcg and hmg mm-hmm. at high doses i did 25 2500 i use hcg every other day for 16 days and then i did 75 i use hmg every other day i don't know where to get rfsh so that's why i did that yeah um then i went on clomid and novadex and also arimidex for like 40 days until I ran out of all of them. 
And now I've been off everything for about 20, 25 days. I've been on nothing, which is why I'm somewhat curious to see what these labs look like because I feel much better, but I still know it's low. Okay. But I, I should reiterate too. Some of the, my goal is get some fertility back this year, obviously, you know, conceive. And then I do want to, at some point, uh, go for a, a while on just like 125 a week of test. And then I want to plan for a meet probably two years down the road and do a 15 week cycle with those mild compounds we talked about. So I'm mm. not trying to go off forever. I'm trying to gain fertility back, uh, down, regulate the androgen receptors and, you know, basically that. become healthier. So even when I do a meet, I want to do it at a lighter weight class on way less harsh stuff. And then I want to come off again after the meet. So basically you want to conceive and you want to change your lifestyle toward a more healthy lifestyle, even though you want to continue. So uh, the reason why I asked that was because I watched your video. And so I'm not sure if I'm going to be totally comprehensive because my thoughts are all over the place, but let's start with, um, because you talked about gonadotropin releasing hormone uh, mimetic. They were giving you one. So just for the audience to know, with, during this discussion, there are three things to know about. The two parts in the brain, the hypothalamus and the pituitary, that's the HP. And the third part is the gonads, the balls, they're the G. So there's three parts in this axis. So you were mentioning in your video, and just for the audience to know, remember the hypothalamus, pituitary, and gonads. The pituitary produces LH and FSH. LH tells the gonads to produce testosterone. FSH tells the gonads to differentiate and proliferate sperm cells. So uh, that's from the pituitary. Now, uh, Pete was given a gonadotropin-releasing hormone mimetic, which would tell his hypothalamus to produce gonadotropin-releasing hormone, which would tell his pituitary to produce those two hormones, LH and FSH. But the thing is, as you said, it's not very effective. That's true. And in addition to it, if you're actually just trying to get the fertility from your gonads, because fertility only comes from the gonads, you actually don't need the brain to be working at all. So all you need for the gonads to work is actually the HCG, which is copying the LH and the recombinant FSH or HMG, which is copying the FSH. You only need those two. And then you need to take them at a long enough time that your balls actually heal and slowly begin to be able to produce sperm uh, properly. It'll take a while for even the sperm metrics to improve, but it takes months. So the studies show, and I should add another component here. Now, why is this, uh, before we talk about, uh, but before we talk about time on and stuff like that, why are people using aromatase inhibitors, Clomid and Nolvidex? The reason is one, estradiol is a negative feedback indicator to the hypothalamus, not the pituitary to the hypothalamus in gonadotropin-releasing hormones uh, secretion. So if your hypothalamus feels a lot of estradiol in your body, it says, hey, we have too much testosterone. You're aromatizing too much. So I need to stop producing as much testosterone. So the the hypothalamus stops producing as much gonadotropin-releasing hormone and LH and FSH go down. So why do we take an AI to lower estradiol? So if an obese person who can't have kids, a 340, 400 pound uh, obese guy who eats, uh, you know, food every day and doesn't work out, can't have kids. What can he do to have kids? Just taking an AI by itself improves fertility. There are studies that show obese people go on an AI, have a kid. Okay. So just it reduces the amount of aromatization they have because of their fat. So just that can cause them to produce more LH and FSH and fix it. You can also use something that modulates your estrogen receptors like Clomid. The better version is not Clomid. This is something I introduced to the to the community. It's called N-Clomiphene Citrate. It's another version, a newer version. It's superior. And Derek from More Plates, More Dates has a um, uh, HRT clinic called Merrick Health, and they carry N-Clomiphene Citrate. And I can connect you with them. I, I know the guy who manages it. They're a good clinic. They have N-Clomiphene Citrate. And they have recombinant FSH, I think, also. So, so okay. N-Clomiphene Citrate at uh, usually 50 milligrams uh, they take a day to modulate those estrogen receptors. And then sometime on, in addition to that, like I did, they'll take a little bit of aromatase inhibitor to keep estrogen actually down. So you're feeling very little estrogen in your brain, but this is actually only to restart the hypothalamus to tell the pituitary, but you're already replacing the pituitary part. So this part really is mostly about recovery in the long term. It has a little bit of an effect on fertility in the short term, but not that much. It's mainly about this LH and FSH consistently signaling to the gonads for six months to a year to seven years. There's one study I found in which one person regained fertility after using HCG, and I think he was using HMG, consistently for seven years. 
Why, wow. why is that fascinating? It's fascinating because when I was uh, taking androgens, people spread this rumor that the LH receptor and the gonads downregulated. So if you take HCG on cycle, you're not going to be able to respond to it when you go off cycle. That's you what probably, I thought. That's what I, so I, so I was using HCG. Then I started saying this is costly and people are scaring me. So I stopped. And this was completely ridiculous because that's not, you know, you need actually that signaling to the gonads to keep the gonads functional. And if they're not functional, they atrophy. And what's interesting about the seven year study is it shows using the exact same dose of HCG for seven years, after seven years, it worked, which means there wasn't a tachyphylaxis, which means drugs diminishing marginal gains. Like you keep taking a drug over time, like Trembolone, you stop feeling it. Not true for HCG, seven years straight, then it worked. So it does work for long-term. You don't have to be worried about this down-regulation that much. Well, Trenbolone was like the only thing I could take all the time and never feel. Never oh, really? Feel the other wrong. stuff you felt? I, I, you no, felt I, it. You, I, you mean you felt Trenbolone, yeah. Yeah, that's the only, like, I, other stuff, I'm like, this is pretty much being natural. What, what am I doing? Trent, I'm like, <laughs> Trent is like a different level, but. That's um, true. But what I'm trying to say is the idea is that you don't, so, so there are some things that people were spreading around this idea of short term HCG cycles. It's not really that what you're trying to do is send that signal to the gonads so that the gonads start working. And then so gene transcription in your body changes. So your body starts changing all the gene transcription to allow the gonads to, to work well. This takes months and you can improve this a little bit. If depending on how quickly you want to have children, you could potentially take an HDAC inhibitor like uh, butyrate, which is a histone deacetylase inhibitor, which would not be good for your sperm in the short term, but would allow your epigenetics to change more quickly to reflect your new environment. Oh, wow. So it speeds it up a little bit. You could use butyrate or valproate. And my clients are very familiar with these two, two um, things because I use them a lot to help epigenetics uh, change. But the point is, the longer you stay on the FSH and the LH consistently, eventually everything will go in line. Now, the brain won't because the brain is... So the, to get the brain on, you have to have the estradiol low for extended periods. And something I didn't use, but now I discovered is very useful, mifepristone. After you, so what you would do is, for example, you'd use, if you wanted to recover fully, you'd use LH and FSH for a year, year and a half or whatever. And you'd be using an aromatase inhibitor and Clomid or not Clomid the whole year. Maybe you'd use a little bit less. Then when you go off it, you'd go off the FSH and LH and you'd stay on the Clomid and AI for a longer period. And then at the end of that, you take them out and you'd add in mifepristone to block the androgen receptors and tell that hypothalamus to start. And when that thing starts, you'd add in aromatase inhibitor at a low dose and stay, stay like that. That's the best way to recover long-term. I'm not an aromatase inhibitor because I care a lot about health, but, um, but yeah, that's my approach. So, so get back on HCG and RFSA, try to get that. And so I know you're life. doing something experimentally now. I would look to see what the result is first. Yeah, and my LH and FSH rebounded a little. Like it was 2.3 FSH, 1.2 LH, whereas they were 0.1 before. And so I'm curious what this looks like, but won't, doesn't HCG shut down your LH again? Pretty much because yes. you're. So, so it doesn't, it doesn't actually shut it down, to be honest. It, it, the, the feedback signal is not from there. The feedback signal is from your testosterone. So your LH turns your gonads on to make testosterone. You're not going to make much anyway. And whatever you make, a little bit of it will be aromatized. That will signal back to your hypothalamus. So the aromatization is the only problem. You could have high test. You block all that estradiol. You're not signaling back there. So that's one thing. And another thing that's not explored enough by people is blocking progesterone. And, and I want to research this. And I talked to Steve from the Bio Bros podcast. I think Steve and I will do a little bit of research into this, but there should be ways to improve this also by blocking a little bit of the progesterone receptors also. But progesterone and estradiol are the negative feedback signals, not the LH, not the agonism of the LH receptor. So if you're on ACG and you're blocking your estrogen, your LH will still rise? It, it Well, it should rise, but actually it stays a bit low. But but you're right. You're right. Academically, I don't know why. It, there's, the feedback signals are only from estradiol and progesterone. But that's true. Everybody who uses LA, uh, HCG, their LH never rises that high. Mm, I have to I have to look at papers to. I mean, I have to look at blood blood work to check. But I think it does rise a little bit. I know a guy. He he didn't ever take heavy cycles or anything. But he did 1500 IU's a week or twice a week of HCG, and his test levels were 1100. Um, just of just from just using HCG, just HCG. 
Yeah, there are some people like that. I mean, actually, the, yeah, I had one consultation yesterday of a guy that was at uh, even a higher amount just from Clomid, which was crazy. And he went from from much lower, from half. He added Clomid, he went to 1,033 from like 600. But yeah, some people respond oddly. But the point is, yeah, it's just about that consistent. So if you if you use... You don't actually need your pituitary to start working to have kids. You just need okay. your gonads to work. So, so don't worry about that. Yeah. So what I would do if I were you would be to have that enclomiphene citrate in there, have the uh, an AI in there, and enclomiphene citrate for the short term because you're going to have kids. And then I would uh, get the HCG in there. And by the way, just so you know, there are studies using 15,000 units uh, a week for extended periods. So uh, 2,500 units every other day is not too much. Uh, you could use that and uh, recombinant FSH like you're using 75 units, just like the HMG. Now, recombinant FSH, you can find easily. Most people okay. get it. Most people get it from t- guys in Turkey that will mail it to you. But that's risky because it comes over the borders and stuff like that. You should probably get it from a clinic. It's a little bit less risky. But okay. the brand names are the brand name usually in, from Turkey is called Gonal F, G-O-N-A-L-F. It's actually okay. called... Um, Folotropin alpha. There's there's more than one follicle stimulating hormone recombinant version. There's also luteinizing hormone that's recombinant. Uh, it's called okay. lutropin alpha, but that's a bit expensive and probably unnecessary. Well, what's, so I haven't even been down Clomid in like 25 days and HCG and HMG in like 60. What, what's going on? Where like the whole month of January, I was depressed. I felt my, I was getting weaker every day and like. I would do one set of lifting and I would be so sore. I couldn't do anything else. And now I'm like, I can do multiple sets. I feel stronger. I'm getting stronger again. Like what's going on there? Is it just, I'm not even on anything. Fascinating. You're saying that you felt weaker when you went off and you feel better now. Well, yeah, like January. Or you feel less depressed, you mean? Yeah, January was a struggle because January, I was still taking Clomid up to a certain point until I ran out. Oh, it's because of the, it could be because of the Clomid. Sorry, Clomid makes people feel horrible. I don't know if you know that. Is it when you stop taking Clomid? What's that? Is it when you stop taking Clomid that you felt better? Yeah, ever since then, I feel much better. Yeah, Clomid. uh, Women feel horrible on Clomid. So, by the way, women uh, will often take Clomid um, between days two and seven of their ovulation it will make them much more likely to get pregnant. Yeah. Also, it's like 10% more likely to get twins. But uh, when they do that, the mood, uh, um, you, if you ever see this, it's horrible. Women suffer so much from Clomid and men do also, but not all men and some won't notice it. So you probably just didn't notice and you were it was the Clomid the whole time. But why am I getting stronger now? Whereas before my lifts were going through the floor. This is very now, mysterious. I don't know. Now I'm, it's rebound. I'm like, Holy crap, I can train again. Like I'm not as strong no as I was, obviously. But like today I pulled 650 with no belt. And I'm like, wow. I couldn't have done that. You know, I don't know. I'm like, what's going on here? I have no idea at all. I feel like I'm getting stronger again. I never got to have that experience because I totally stopped lifting weights. <laughs> so I, when I, I, I was still lifting a little bit on TRT. And then when I stopped the TRT, I never saw a gym again. I just went to visit Scott sometimes. I never, it's, so I, <laughs> I that's don't know. Saying. Yeah, I don't know what happened. So you're documenting that for us. You're the first person well, showing that. <laughs> this is why I'm kind of like, man, if I go on HCG, that's not really natural. Whereas right now I'm on nothing. No, but I'm you curious. can you can go off it though. But if you want to get the job done, that's yeah, way and faster. That's what's important. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not talking about getting it done in a month. It takes three months yeah. for the sperm to go through the cycle. And you're going to need at least two cycles. So okay. to get that really done well. So so what I would do is go on the on the HCG and FSH and stay like that for six months, get the job done, and then go off those. Because then you'll get even cool. a better likelihood of recovering. You get, hit the yeah. mifepristone, an AI, and you'll recover as best as you can. Yeah, I don't want to do that because I'm kind of conflicted. I'm like, this is fascinating, not being on anything to see what's going on, see if I'm getting stronger, and I am, and I feel better. And But at the same time, I'm like, what's more important, obviously? So... I think that's the way to go, what you said, because I'm like, this is no, very but this is quite fascinating. Also, for my sake, I'm more entertained watching you try stuff with no testosterone in your body. Obviously, Yeah, dude, I, <laughs> I'm like January. I felt like death. Part of that could have been the climate. And I, I was weak as a kitten and I just was like depressed. And now I'm like February. I'm like, oh, I feel awesome. Like my mood is the best it's ever been. Everybody's saying that. Everybody at the gym is like, wow, you're so much nicer, like you're so much nicer, friendly. 
when I was on androgens, I always felt like I had a brain fog, like I was clouded. It wasn't really me. My personality was different. And that's been so enjoyable right there. Hey, we need to talk about that next time. I would love to talk more about your experiences on trend. And maybe I could tell some of mine also, which I've never talked about, I think. And not something specific, but just my experiences. Because I think people understate how much it affects your psychology. And maybe we could talk about it from personal experience. I've done 100 milligrams a week, a day also for six months straight. So I I know what it felt like to some degree. It was uh, very interesting to say the least. We, we can do that. My wife banned me from ever taking it again. <laughs> yeah, she should. That's the thing. It's a relationship killer. It makes, I will, t- will t- yeah, we should tell stories about that next time. Look, how about we leave it here for now okay. and we schedule one soon. Have you yes. on again. We'll continue. And then we'll do like a biohacking and powerlifting podcast here. And All by right, the way, I want to leave one last thing. I just want the audience to know I have nothing against Jason Blaha. And I just, yes. I didn't want to put you in an awkward position. I was kidding with you when I sent that message. I didn't mean it in a bad way. I know Jason is a bit sensitive because I make some jokes about him, but I don't mean it in a bad way. And uh, I, I find Jason very entertaining. And, you know, I don't mean to get in between you guys. And so, Jason, you have no need to warn him. I like you and I like Pete and everyone likes each other. So, yeah, so. I saw his video and I like you both. So I was like, Maybe I could bridge the gap between both of you and bring them on. I would on love to have Jason as an interview, by the way. I would it, love J- to. Jason gets trolled all the time and he has never been anything but super nice to me. So I, I'm really cool with him. I don't talk to him all the time or anything, but like he's always been super nice to me and he gets trolled all the time in his comments and everything like that. But, um, well, I will say, say I'll, I'll, I'll say one thing in the defense of Jason, which is that, you know, the reason why I started disliking Jason before when I when I disliked him for a period was because he used to respond like a little bit harshly to comments when people would leave a comment and I would see him responding. So I thought that he's just generally a rude guy, but I didn't have a YouTube channel. When I started my own channel and I see the kind of comments you get, I can only imagine what comments he's yeah. getting. And what happens is this, just for the audience to know, you're responding to a comment. That comment might not be mean, but you just got 20 mean comments before it. And you're not in your right mind. You're not like thinking properly and you just see negativity when it's not even there. So I think Jason has been more rude to people by by accident because there's so much of the net of the comments, which is his own doing because of, you know, he has a, there's a reason they stalk him, but still, I understand that. So that's the reason I, I thought he wasn't a nice guy, but now I understand that more. So anyway, I don't want to put you in an awkward place, Pete. I no, just want no, you to no. know, Jason, I, there's nothing against you. And, you know, I just try to get along with everybody and like yeah, exactly. with mean comments. I just, I literally go, thank you very much and stuff like that. And it confuses them. And that's the, <laughs> that's the best way to approach people like that. If I ever get, <laughs> if I ever get bad comments and it, like on that, video Derek made about me. There were a couple and I'm just like, thank you very much. And they don't know what to do. Yeah. When Derek made the video, I messaged him that day. I was like, Hey, Pete's coming on my show. Did you know that? He said, I didn't know. So yeah. Yeah. You don't, I mean, you, you're, you have such a reputation of being a nice guy. I don't know how to, how you did that with trend, to be honest with you. I, I would have been wasn't on trend. No, I met <laughs> Greg Doucette when I was on trend, but um, you met Greg Doucette. Oh yeah. We did a meet together, but Oh, well, we have to talk about that next time. This is too interesting. (laughs) We'll leave that for the next one. We live it on a cliff, a cliffhanger. All right. All right. Pete. Thank you so much for joining us. It was really a pleasure. Hey, we'll talk offline. Uh, Send me your number if you can on email. So I'll text you and we can chat back and forth, you know? Oh yeah. Appreciate it. Big time, buddy. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Pete, for coming on. It was really a pleasure. Oh yes. Thank you very much. All right. Talks.